views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Award from the Lord. We are so glad you're with us and you've chosen to continue studying God's Word with us tonight. I uh, want to say I enjoyed uh, Caleb's lesson, what I heard of it, and uh, some of the things that he talked about. I know we're going to be covering tonight. But we want to always remind you, friends, that if you want to study God's Word, as, as Caleb was saying, we really invite you to come out and be with us. We meet at uh, 250 The Boulevards, where we meet in Eden. Uh, there in 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville, 120 American Legion in Danville. If you'd like to get a hold of me, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's how you can reach me. 276-340-2653 is uh, a way you can reach me. We'd have a Bible study together. We just want to study the Bible with someone. And if you know someone who wants to study the Bible, you can say, you know what, you need to give the folks in the Church of Christ a call because they will study the Bible with you. If you're, if you're sincerely interested in studying the Bible, you want to know what God's will for you is, then we want to know that very thing too. And so we'll be glad to study with you and we invite you to come out and be with us. Uh, all the information that we have, friends, is free of charge. Uh, I heard Caleb uh, offering uh, the book, A Muscle and Shovel. We have a copy of this uh, book's excellent book. We, we give them away. We hope that you will uh, read it and study it <clears throat> and uh, uh, realize that the man that wrote the book it's probably, uh, you're probably walking in his shoes or he's walking in your shoes. You probably have a lot of things in common, so we hope that you will take advantage of that very thing as well. Free DVDs uh, of our, our lessons, everything is free. We never ask you for money. We want you to come out and realize that uh, we know the gospel is free, and so we want to uh, give that to you in any way, shape, or form that we can. Tonight, friends, what I want to do is I want to show you just how easy it is to understand what uh, um, denominational doctrines are all about. In other words, how easy it is to answer them if you know just a little bit of the Bible. Because oftentimes what people do is they look at, they, they hear something, they say, well, that sounds good, but they don't know whether it's in the Bible or not. So what we want to do is we want to encourage you to study God's Word and realize that oftentimes the answer to one false doctrine is also the answer to another false doctrine. <clears throat> and we'll show you how that works tonight. Now, I want to start off with this verse in Mark, Mark 4, verse 24. Jesus said, uh, he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, and what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall be more, uh, more be given. So the idea is you need to take care, take, pay attention to how you're listening, what you're listening to. You know, be a careful hearer is what he's saying. Then he said again in Luke 8 and verse 18, notice, he says, Take heed therefore how ye hear, for, whatsoever, uh, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. So you really need to pay attention, friends. You may think, you may think that you have the Bible wrapped up, that you know it frontward and backward, left and right, upside down, in every way, shape, or form. But the fact of the matter is, if what you've been hearing is something that the man's been telling you, and you never stop to check it out, you may not know if you know the truth or not. So you need to pay attention how you hear. And what I want to tell you tonight is, if you listen carefully to what people say, it may be that what you hear will help you answer another thing that you've heard. In other words, you may think something is true, and you may know another doctrine over here is false. But if you understand what is false, you know how to find if something is true or not, and you say, well, that doctrine is false, you know what, that same thing, that same uh, uh, reasoning may apply to another doctrine. Now, let me just a little boy be a little more specific <clears throat> so we can just get down to what we're talking about. Here's my point. Fake, uh, false doctrines often breed false doctrines. In other words, they, they run hand in hand because they're all... Kin. They all come from the same source. They come from the same uh, root, and that is uh, a, a lie. They come from the devil. The devil's a liar. He wasn't a liar from the beginning, Jesus said. And so when you realize something is false, you will soon realize, you know what, this is, this is the same false doctrine. It's very similar to a false doctrine that I heard somewhere else. And so if one thing's false for, for this reason, then another thing may be false. Now, I want to show you just how close false doctrines are. 
the doctrines of denominationalism, they may seem to be different, and they all claim to be different. Uh, there are different churches, different denominations, man-made churches. They're all different because they teach some things that are different. <clears throat> but oftentimes, some of the things that they teach are very similar, yet they don't want you to think that they're the same. In other words, they're teaching, some people are teaching a doctrine, and they don't want you to know that it's, it's like something else. For example, we're not talking about that tonight, but say the Mormons who teach that, that uh, Jesus is, is, uh, is not really, that he's a created being, uh, you know, they may not, and, and therefore they uh, change the scriptures to, uh, uh, to justify that. They may not want you to know, you know what, the Mormons will basically view Jesus the same way, or the Jehovah's Witness view Jesus the same way. So they, they say, well, no, we're not like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness or the Muslims. Oh, yes, you are in the sense of how you treat Jesus, how you look at Jesus. You don't look at him as the Son of God. You look at him as, as, uh, <clears throat> as something else contrary to what the Bible says. And so it's easy to see, you know what, if this, if this doctrine can be answered by, by this argument, then another one can too. Let's give you another example. Um, uh, in Galatians 1, 6-9, where Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto another gospel, which is not another. And then he goes on to say, there's a curse upon anybody who brings another gospel. Well, the Mormons come along and they'll tell you, yeah, the Book of Mormon is a, another testament of Jesus Christ. That right, that right there is contradicted in the Bible. And they'll say, well, the Bible is right in as much as it's translated correctly. Well, that's the same thing that the, that the Muslims say. That's the same thing that Jehovah's Witnesses say. See, they have their own Bible. So, so again, it, you, you find some common ground here, and it's easy to answer false doctrines if you know what to listen for. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at some things concerning salvation, and I want you to listen carefully to what people have said all along, and you say, well, I don't know if that's right or wrong. Let's see if we can answer it. But what I want to show you is when we get to when you hear what most people say <coughs> about, about salvation and you learn what the Bible is really saying about it, you'll start to realize, you know what, there's another doctrine that sounds very similar to that. But let's first, let's look at what some denominational, denominational doctrines are concerning uh, salvation. What is their plan of salvation? All right? Uh, I'm not going to play one of these clips because I know it's very poor audio. I'll tell you who it is. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fella on, uh, I guess that would be your, your left, your far left over here, is uh, uh, Mr. Sparrow right up here in Eden and uh, Wendell Sparrow. And he's, he, he, gives, he tells people, looks at the camera, tell them, say, you know, say a sinner's prayer, ask Jesus to come to your heart and you'll be saved. And if you say that prayer, you're saved, blah, 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 blah. All right. Well, I'm going to say that the audio was terrible. But uh, that's, that's what he says. If you don't believe it, that he says it, then, you know, I'll be glad to play it for you. You can call me up and say, I want to hear that, and, and we'll take the time to play it. But that's, that's what he says. They all say, ask Jesus. Now, this, this, uh, these two guys on the, the right over here, they're from <clears throat> Mercy Crossings, Church of God. Are they worth the time? I don't know if, if uh, uh, Rodney Billings is still in the... Uh, the church of God over there, but listen to what they say about salvation. Listen to their plan of salvation. You an opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yes. That's the reason we do what we do. We don't sing uh, just for entertainment. We, and the reason we do what we do is so that souls will come to know God. Yes. And I just want to read this little sinner's prayer on this little pamphlet I was telling you about. And if you don't know Christ today, if you'll just pray this very prayer, and I'm just going to read it as a prayer, and then we're going to go right back into the singing. But if you don't know Christ today, just take a moment and, and receive him into your life. I tell you, Rodney, uh, the times we're living in, I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to spend a minute without Christ in my heart. You're right. And, and it's right. so we simple to say this prayer that you're about to read to us. Right. And, and those that are watching my home, at home, Repeat what he is saying. Yes. Read it from your heart. Ask Jesus Christ into your heart. He'll change you. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Let's pray, Rodney. Dear Jesus, I confess to you today that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are truly the Son of God. 
I invite you into my heart. Take control of my life. Wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. Okay, now did you hear that? Jesus, come into my heart. Wash my, wash my sins away uh, with, with your blood and, and so forth. Now, all of that is typical what you hear from a sinner's prayer. A little different variations, you might say. And you say, well, I've heard that all my life, James, so I don't really know that that's, uh, that's not true. Is, is, that really, uh, uh, I, I, is that really false? Is that really, what, is that really something contrary to the Bible? Well, it is. It is. And we'll, we'll show you why in, in just a moment. But I want to give you another variation of the sinner's prayer. And this is what I'm talking about, friends. Sinner's prayer comes in, very, in many shapes and sizes. I don't know. I've picked up different tracks, and I see it all... Uh, uh, you know, all different words or whatever. But one thing I never see, I never see a scripture that says, here's the sinner's prayer. But when you ask people about the sinner's prayer, sometimes this is what they say. Now, uh, the two guys that we just heard, they didn't really give a scripture. They just, they just said, ask Jesus to come to your heart, say his little prayer. This is the better attempt at it, you might say. This is um, uh, Brian Edwards, the lady calls in and is going to give the sinner's prayer. And they're going to say that it's in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14. Listen to what they say. Because I sit in his service every Sunday. Sounds like you're wedded to him. No, I'm not. Well, is the sinner's prayer that he preaches in the Bible? Yes, it is. Where is it? I'll give you $1,000 tonight if you, can, if you can reference it. Well, he preaches the Bible. Well, how about he gives it to you? He's your preacher. He I can, preaches. I, I can give that to you. I can give that to you. Go ahead and give it. I can give that to you. Go ahead and give it. Go ahead and give it. Uh, Republican prayed, be merciful to me, a sinner, and he went away justified. He doesn't. Now, my, now, ma'am, Luke 18 is the publican, and he is already a child of God. He is in the temple. He and the, and the other individual are both at the temple. He is not a lost person like you or I would be a Gentile. Okay, ma'am, thank you for calling. Let, let me just make this statement very quickly. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, if you study, Zacchaeus was a publican, a tax collector. They were the lowest of the low, hated by society. If he's beating himself on the chest and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner, present tense, then how was he already a Christian? Uh, no one said he was a Christian. We said he was a child of God. If you read in Luke, in Luke 19, you'll find Zacchaeus is a person who is of Israel too. That's why we're here, friends. We're constantly helping you to see that these people are not outside of Christ. They were Jews. They were in a relationship with God already born into that relationship. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus that you have to be born again. Being a son of Abraham is not what's going to save you. You have to be the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. And the way that happens is Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. You're baptized into Christ. Then you become fellow heirs with Christ, and you're not fellow heirs until you've been baptized. So Friend, that's not the sinner's prayer. You've got another uh, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I'll tell you, this is what Jesus said. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. One prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The other did not pray, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The one who prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner, walked away uh, saved. He walked away justified. And the word justified simply would imply the payment of his sins were made. Now, friends, we just had Brian Edwards justify you before the blood was shed. And that's what we're talking about. You were justified, he said, before the blood was shed. What we're asking today is how do you be justified after the blood is shed? And you're not going to find it in Luke 18. He's already said you have to confess with your mouth your belief that Jesus raised from the dead, Romans 10.10. 10. You cannot have both. This person didn't know that Jesus had died because he hadn't died. He's justified before the blood. That's not your sinner's prayer. He, right, knew, he knew he was a sinner and Jesus was the okay, Savior. That, if you want that for your sinner's prayer, you go ahead. But that's before Jesus shed his blood. And it certainly isn't the same as Romans 10.10, 10, which he's already referenced tonight. I, I do agree with that. Okay, he, right, knew, he knew he was a sinner and Jesus was the okay, Savior. That, if you want that for your sinner's prayer, you go ahead. But that's before Jesus shed his blood. And it certainly isn't the same as Romans 10.10. 10, I do agree with that. And it certainly... All right. 
Now, so here's here's uh, a man trying to say the sinner's prayer is, is Luke 18, that a man went down justified. Let me just say, Johnny did a great job of explaining that. He did a very good job. But I want to show you this, friends. This is what we're talking about. Most people in the denominational world, when they hear the sinner's prayer, they say, well, anybody who prays and has their sins forgiven, that's the sinner's prayer. We're talking about an alien sinner. We're talking about someone who doesn't know God, who is outside a relationship with God, and prays to have their sins forgiven as if they uh, had just come to Christ. But there's, a, there's another time, type of prayer in the Bible where individuals who are in a relationship with God could pray and have their sins forgiven. Now, see, the problem, the reason why people have problems with that is because they think that once your sins are forgiven one time, there's no more sin. And that's why Baptists and, and other people who believe in Calvinist doctrine, they have trouble believing that, well, I don't know if a saved man would sin like that. Would, would a man commit adultery? Would a man? Well, why wouldn't he? Is, is he? is he so saved that he will never commit any sins? Now, if you say yes, friends, then you have to answer the question, well, are you perfect? Are you sinlessly perfect? And they'll say, oh, no, I'm not sin. I, you know I sin all the time. Well, are you not saved? See, there's a difference between uh, having your sins forgiven after you're saved and having your sins forgiven by the blood of Christ to become a child of God. Now, no, notice this. In John chapter 1, uh, let's see, I don't have it up here. I have a hard time reading that one. First John chapter uh, 2. Well, um, let me get it over here. First John 1. This is, this is what a lot of people use for the sinner's prayer. They say if we, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ the Son cleanses us from all sins. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this is talking about individuals who have already come into a relationship with God, who are already in Christ where salvation is, 2 Timothy 2.10. These are talking about individuals who are already in a relationship with God who can call him their father and he calls them their children. This is not the sinner's prayer like in order to be saved. This is a prayer for people who are already saved and need their sins cleansed on a continual basis because they sin from time to time. It's not the same. We're talking about the alien sinner's prayer, someone who's outside of Christ. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, they're outside of Christ, without hope uh, in, in the world. That's what we're talking about. So Luke 18 is not the sinner's prayer. It's not just ask Jesus to forgive me and, and you go down justified. Now, Let's look at another one. Here's another. Here's another Baptist preacher. Listen to what he says about the sinner's prayer. Now, so far we've got a we've got several sinners' prayer here. We've got a one sinner's prayer. Just well, just ask Jesus to come to my heart and and wash away my sins with Your blood. You just ask Him that. And then you've got one that says, Well, you just go down, you beat up on your chest, and and you say, Have mercy on me, a sinner, and boom, you go down justified. Then you've got another guy here that's going to say Romans 10, 9 and 10 or 9 through 13, and he's going to give us his version of the sinner's prayer. What I believe, in addition to everything else, I believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to find Church of Christ, Moravians, Methodists, Baptists, probably even find a few Catholics there. I don't believe it. You don't believe that no. at all? Does the Bible say this? Let me ask you this. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt, didn't say you might, thou shalt be saved. Does it say that? Mm -hmm. Does the Bible say this? Let me ask you this. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt, didn't say you might, thou shalt be saved. Does it say that? Mm -hmm. So if I belong to a Catholic church and I've said that, you're telling me I'm not going to heaven. That's right. Well, you're wrong. But All right, so... Here is Mr. Randy Linderman saying that even if a Catholic says that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then they're 
you know, they're going to go to heaven. Now, later on, he's going to say he didn't have fellowship with Catholics because they believe a different doctrine. So I don't know how he, just, how he gets around that. But anyway, we're talking about the sinner's prayer here. So here, the sinner's prayer is, is uh, <clears throat> called on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and you shall be saved, is what he says. So now we've got one, one, one person's attempting Luke 18. Another one's just saying, well, just say a little prayer and ask Jesus to wash me your blood. Uh, this one's saying Romans 10. 9 and 10. Let's get one more here. Here's uh, Amen. Tim Whitehart. The problem today is many of us don't know the Word of God. I was listening the other day. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to study to show yourself approved. You say, I'm such and such years old, and that's for the women, that's for the children. No, sir. All of us. We got to, if we're going to stand, we've got to know the Bible and at least read the Word of God. At least read it. You may not know the scripture and verse, but bless God, you'll know if something's wrong or somebody quotes something that's not supposed to be there. Amen. Know the Bible. And know that something's right. I was listening to somebody the other day uh, on a call-in talk uh, show, and this guy loves to take people's words and twist them. He loves to take them, and, and that's what he lives for. And so this poor lady called in, and she goes to a Baptist church, and, and she said, I've asked Jesus in my heart. And he says, where in anywhere in the Bible does it say, if you ask Jesus in your heart, you're going to be saved? And he asked her that question because he knew that she did not know the Bible. You could just tell in a few minutes that she didn't know the Bible. She's like, scared to death. What oh, You've got me shaking, you know. And I'm sitting there looking at the screen going, Acts 16.31. Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what he told him. And I'm sitting there saying, Romans 10, 9, that if I shall confess in my mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe it on heart. Acts 10, 9. Acts 10, 10. But she didn't know those things. Went to a Baptist church her whole life, and it was pitiful listening to her try to defend her salvation. Well, it's kind of pitiful to hear some of these Baptist preachers that won't even defend their, their faith. At least she was trying. She was doing more than what Tim Waddard was doing. Tim Waddard never would come on. So what about all these other Baptist preachers? Are they going to give a defense? So here's what we're talking about, friends. Here's a man that says, all right, Acts, Acts 16.31. He's jumping up now. Acts 16.31. You know, believe in Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Is that the sinner's prayer? Is that what you have to do to be saved? You know, just say the name of Jesus, call on the name of Jesus, confess the name of Jesus, and you'll be saved? See, friends, what we're getting down to is we're getting down to a common phrase here. We're starting to find a common thread in all these so-called sinner's prayers. And that is just say the name of Jesus. Just say the name of Jesus. Everybody that we've listened to, everybody we reference tonight, uh, Mercy Crossing Ch uh, Church of God, the, the Christian Worship Assembly with uh, <clears throat> Mr. Sparrow over here, Blessed Hope Baptist Church in, in Danville, Brian Edwards, New Beginnings Baptist, uh, Freedom Baptist, all, all are saying Ask Jesus or talk to Jesus, call Jesus, call on him, and uh, you'll be saved. All, that's all you need to do for your salvation. Well, is that, is that anything like what other denominations say about salvation? See, there's some denominations that will tell you, no, we don't say this in this prayer. We, we're going to baptize. You need to be baptized in order to be saved, like the Apostolic Church. Now, the United Pentecostal Church, the Apostolic Church, they're going to say, well, yeah, you've got to be baptized. And so they, they would probably reject the sinner's prayer. But here's, here's the point I'm trying to get you to see, friends. If you listen carefully to what they say, you'll realize that one doctrine is very similar to the other and that you can answer them both with, with the same bullet, you might say. They're, they're so close. Now, they, they want you to believe all totally different things. But, friends, they're very, very close, very, very similar. Now, you might say, well, James... The apostolics and the United States cause that's kind of strange doctrine. You know, they believe one in the Godhead. They believe you got to say uh, that you got to baptize in the name of Jesus, and you know, so they believe in baptism. That's nothing like what the Baptists will teach. Baptists, you know, they run from water. They're hydrophobic. They're, they're scared of water, and so they don't have anything to do with water. The apostolics, man, that you know, they're gonna get all up in the water. So, you know, th those two can't be the same. Well. You might be surprised. Listen to what, listen to what the the, uh, uh, the apostolic preacher here, Marty Roberts. Listen to what he says about salvation. 
Okay? You can't make it to heaven without your sins being remitted. And the Bible tells us in Acts 2.38 that repentance and, and, and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is for remission of sins. Because Peter said be baptized. We spoke about that. But let's look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 43 and find out where the remission is. James, I'd like to ask you a question. Is baptism, is remission of sins in baptism alone? Or is baptism in the name? Uh, remission of sins in the name, okay, of Jesus. Because Acts 10 and 43 said to him, Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. How do we receive remission of sins? Through his name. Okay, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Where is remission of sins? It's not in water baptism alone. We've got to go by the Scriptures. I'm not going to go out here and say, I'll baptize you for the remission of sins. I'm going to mention the name of Jesus. Because I believe there's salvation in the name of Jesus. Now, did you hear that, friends? See, he asked me, do you believe that salvation is in, in baptism alone or is it in, in the name of Jesus? Well, friends, I have never said anything about baptism alone. I have never, ever, 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 never, ever, never said that salvation is in baptism alone. He makes the same flawed argument that the Baptists and other people uh, make when they're trying to answer what the Bible says about salvation. They want to say faith only saves, not baptism. Well, we never said baptism only. Now, if you, want to, if you want to make an argument the Bible does not teach you're saved by baptism only, I'll, I'll gladly defend that. I'll agree with that. The Bible does not teach saved by baptism only, but it does teach that baptism is part of salvation. Peter said, The light figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. So, so, yes, baptism is a part, but never baptism only. But here's Mr. Marty Roberts. Now, did you hear what he said? He said, it's in the name of Jesus. You've got to preach the name of Jesus. That's where remission of sins in the name of Jesus. Acts 10, 43, I'm going to preach remission of sins in the name of Jesus. So isn't that very much like what the sinner's prayer crowd says? Now, Mr. Marty Roberts, he's going to say, oh, no, you've got to be baptized. He's, going, he's not going to run to the sinner's prayer, but yet, you know what? He's making the exact same argument they make. They say just say a little prayer and call, Jesus, call on the name of Jesus. And he'd say no, but yet then he turns around and says, well, you know, it's in the name of Jesus. I'm going to preach the name of Jesus because that's where remission of sins is. Now, listen, folks, this is what we're talking about. You see how closely they are? See how close they are? When individuals want to talk about uh, being saved and they want to get away from baptism, listen to what arguments they make. They, they, they say very much like what Mr. Uh, Marty Roberts just said. It's, it's not baptism. It doesn't have anything to do with baptism. Notice, here's uh, uh, a call from a lady. She asked a question. You on the word from the Lord? Uh, yes. I just recently started watching your program, but I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, number one, the baptism. Uh-huh. I don't, uh, I think that if I were to get saved today and... I got killed or I died before I got to get baptized. I'm still gonna go to heaven. Now, now, how do you how do you come to that conclusion? If I get saved, okay, and then I get killed or I die or whatever before I get to get baptized, hmm. because you don't get baptized the same day you're saved. How do you now? What, now, can you give me a verse for that? A verse? Can you give me a Bible verse where or an example in the Bible where? Someone was saved. Your question. I'm sorry. I'm asking a question. Okay. If I get saved today, and tomorrow I get run over by a truck or whatever, I die. And I haven't gotten to get baptized. Am I still going to heaven? You want to work in the Lord? I want to say to the lady that called in just a few seconds ago, she was puzzled about getting saved. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, "For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that who shall ever." Believe it in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, is that all she has to do is believe? Accept 
him into her heart. Now, where does it say accept him into your heart? In Ma, uh, listen, uh, James. Now, ma'am. Um, no, no, listen. You listen to me. You, I ask you a question. You made a statement. I am quoting what God says okay. in the Bible. Now, ma'am, I'm going to quote you what God says, too. Go ahead. God says, repent. Now, where is repent in John 3, 16? All right. You hear that? She's going to call in, and she's going to tell the lady, the first lady that called in, what she needs to do to be saved. Now, I put those two together. I, I answered the first lady uh, in the original call. But here she's saying, well, if I get saved, I don't need baptism. I'm going to get saved before I baptize. Well, friends, the Bible doesn't talk about that. The Bible doesn't separate baptism from salvation. It actually puts them together. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus put them together. Now the second lady called in. She says, well, you know what? She said, uh, uh, if, if that lady just, John 3, 16, that's all you need. Now there's other people that call to try to get John, make John 16, John 3, 16, their, uh, if you want to say their conversion account or their plan of salvation, listen to this other caller. Or do you have to repent? Yes, you do. So you repent. But you said, where did it say that you can get saved without baptism? That's right. Now, did well, you, I quoted it. John 3.16 didn't say get saved without baptism. Didn't, well, what did it say? It said, he that believeth shall not perish. That's right. But what? About, can you get saved without repenting? No, you repent what, what, before you get saved. I mean, okay, listen. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold yes. on. Hold on. It always happens, friends. I, people call in with John 3.16, and they want to say their salvation without baptism. But you know what? If that salvation without baptism, that salvation without repentance. Now, ma'am, is are you going to tell me that you can be saved without repentance? No. Then you where is repentance in John 3.16? See that? See, friends? What we're showing people is you have to take the whole of God's commands on what to do to be saved. You can't separate baptism out and just say, well, Jesus died on the cross. This lady, this lady quoting John 3, 16, says, Whosoever believeth on him, uh, for God so loved the world, that gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. She just has you being saved at the point of belief. You don't have to confess anything. The rest of these folks are going, oh, you just got to confess Jesus. The apostolic is going, oh, you got to confess Jesus. It's not in baptism. You know, you've got to say the name of Jesus. You've got to say the name of Jesus. But see, they all want to separate from baptism. They all want to pull something away from baptism. That's my point, is they all have something in common, and that is they don't really understand what the Bible's teaching about salvation. Now, let's go back to, let's go back to Mr. Marty Roberts. Marty <clears throat> says very, something very similar to what the apostolics say. I mean, what the uh, rest of the denomination say. Listen to what he says again. He says that salvation takes place when you pronounce the name of Jesus. Because there's a name that has authority. His name is the authority that we operate on. And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. Do you think the blood is applied when you call out the name Jesus? Yes, it is, because... Uh, Why do you believe the blood is applied when you call out the name Jesus? In the name of Jesus, the blood that is in the name of Jesus. So we're missing the sins. The only way that you can get your sins remitted is by the blood, and the only way the blood is applied is in the name of Jesus. Now, now you, because there's a name that has authority. His name is the authority that we operate on, and then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. Now, friends, that, that sounds an awful lot like the sinner's prayer, doesn't it? But you know what? When I pointed this out, when I pointed this out to Marty Roberts, the apostolic, and I pointed out, you know what? You sound just like the denominations. You know what? He got mad about it. Listen to what he said. Listen to what he said. I, I think I have established clear enough for anybody who's been watching my program 
I certainly believe in Jesus, and I certainly believe in preaching the name of Jesus, that is, the authority of Christ, and that you must submit to him. Marty simply says, all you have to do is say Jesus, and really, that's not much different than what uh, the, the Baptist or whoever else say, just call, call on Jesus and be saved. I mean, they say Jesus uh, uh, received into your heart, no, sir. and that's what they believe. Well, that's not far from what you believe. You don't want to compare me to say that I don't be I'm believing like that because... Well, but uh, you're saying says, it's all in saying the, the name. If, it, if the power is in saying the name... You don't want to compare me to say that I don't be I'm believing like that. You don't want to compare me to say that I don't be I'm believing like that. You don't want to compare me to say that I don't be I'm believing like that. You don't want to compare me to that. You, you, you don't want, yeah, I do want to compare you to that. You know why? Because if the shoe fits. Listen, one person is saying, call the name of Jesus. Another person says, well, just ask Jesus to wash, wash away your sins in his blood. Just ask him. Another one's going, John 16, 31, you know, just call the name of the Lord. Just believe on Jesus and you'll be saved. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, confess Jesus and you'll be saved. Another lady calls and says, John 3, 16, just believe on Jesus, you'll be saved. And then Marty's going, well, salvation is in the name of Jesus. When you pronounce the name of Jesus, as remission of sins. When you pronounce the name of Jesus. Now, friends, I can't help it if I start listening to all these false doctrines that, as we pointed out, all come from the same source. I can't help it if I point this out and I say, you know what, y'all all sound the same, really. When it gets right down to it, you really just don't want to do what God says. And to say that you believe something different than what the, the Baptist or the other folks believe is really, you know, just kind of a, a play on words, like, you know, tomato, tomato. You're, you're saying the same thing, whether you like it or not. Listen again to the sinner's prayer. And, and it's so simple to say this prayer that you're about to read to us. Right. And, and those that are watching my home, at home, Repeat what he's saying. Yes. Mean it from your heart. Ask Jesus Christ into your heart. He'll change you. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Let's pray, Ronnie. Dear Jesus, I confess to you today that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are truly the Son of God. I invite you into my heart. Take control of my life. Wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. Take control of my life. Wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. Wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. All right. Wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. That's a prayer. Jesus, wash away everything bad in my life through your blood. Now, listen again. Because there's a name that has authority. His name is the authority that we operate on. And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. Do you think the blood is applied when you call out the name of Jesus? Yes, it is, because... Uh, Why do you believe the blood is applied when you call out the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, the blood that is in the name of Jesus. So remission of sins. That is the only way that you can get your sins remitted is by the blood. And the only way the blood is applied is in the name of Jesus. Now, now you... And then when we pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. When you pronounce that name, it brings remission of sins. Well, isn't that what Mark Stocks just said? Wash away everything bad in my life with your blood. And then Marty's going, when you pronounce a name, it takes away, it, it, it brings remission of sins. Now, that sounds like the same thing to me. That sounds like the same thing to me. I mean, here, here's the difference. Here's a guy going, I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to call on Jesus. And I'm going to ask him to forgive me my sins. He'll forgive my sins if I just call on Jesus. Say, Jesus, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and my sins are going to be forgiven. And Marty's over here going, no, that, that will only work if you stand in water. Isn't that silly? Marty wants you standing in the baptistry when, he, when you say it. And then your sins are forgiven. Because remember, he's already said, it didn't have, it's not really baptism. It's calling that name of Jesus. Call that name of Jesus, and that's when your sins are remitted. That's when your sins are forgiven. Just call that name of Jesus. Well, why do I have to get wet to do that? See, friends, the, the bottom line is all of these individuals, they say they believe something different, but really when it gets right down to it, they just don't want to do what God says, or they don't understand what a person must do to be saved. They're hung up on what it means to, to call on the name of the Lord, 
They're, they're hung up on what the Bible is really teaching about salvation. And so they come up with all these convoluted and different uh, uh, versions of salvation that are all contrary to the Bible. You want to work from the Lord? You want to work from the Lord? Caller, are you there? I got a question. Okay. Go. You're on the air. Okay. You don't have to be baptized. Why was Jesus baptized? Are you are you are you uh, Jesus? I'm asking you a question. And I'm asking you one back. Are you Jesus? Jesus was baptized to fulfill our righteousness, not for the forgiveness of sins. Are you baptized for the same reason Jesus was? Are you sinless? Hello? We was all born in sin. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, but if that were the case, can you be baptized for the same reason Jesus was baptized? No, because Jesus hadn't sinned, but he still was baptized. Okay. So. 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 What? So what? You, you're you're arguing yourself out of your out of your why point. You don't have to be baptized. I believe you do have to be baptized. Do you think you have to be baptized? Yeah, I was baptized. Do you think a person has to be baptized to be saved? Yes. Okay. Now, the question is, so we're on the same page on that. Now, the question is, at what point does salvation take place? In other words, are you saved before you're baptized? Or are you saved after you're baptized? Explain to me how I'm going to be saved if I'm not baptized and have received Christ. I ask it one more time. I said, how can I be saved if I haven't been baptized and received Christ? You can't be. You can't be. I'm not, I'm not teaching that you can be saved without being baptized. Well, why do you feel that, why do you feel that you shouldn't have to repent? Well, the Bible says repent. Acts 17 verse 30, Paul said, God commanded all men everywhere to repent. So I know it's, I know it's a command that we, that we repent. God commanded all men everywhere to repent. So that's why we repent. Okay, you got another question? Are we helping you? No, you're not helping me. No. Okay, well then. You have a blessed night. All right. Okay. I, she's acting like we're on the same page, but yeah, she's arguing with me. So I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. Am I... Am I not making myself clear on this? Friends, the Bible clearly teaches you have to be baptized for the remission of sins. Jesus said, we just read this in Mark 16, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation comes after you're baptized in obedience to God, not before. So Jesus was baptized for a completely different reason than what you and I have to be baptized. So I don't, didn't really understand the, the caller's question on that. I'm not really sure she understood uh, what I was saying, and that may have been part of the problem. But nonetheless, but all of these individuals, friends, that, that teach, call on Jesus and have your sins forgiven or say his name when you're standing in water, it all comes down to they don't understand what the Bible teaches about salvation or what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Now, we've got just a few minutes left, so let me, let me just uh, see if we can put this up here. Here is the problem. Notice this. In Acts 2 and verse 21, Acts 2, 21, <clears throat> and I'm going to learn one of these days. I just might as well just put my, uh, the Bible up here on the screen. I think I can get a little better than putting the verses in the, uh, into the, the slide here. But in Acts 2 and verse 21, here's what Peter said. 
And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this is what Peter is telling the crowd in, on the day of Pentecost. Whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now he goes on and he and the other 11 are standing there preaching and they convince all these Jews, they convict all these Jews that you killed the Christ. You are the murderers. You, uh, uh, you killed the Holy One. You did what your fathers always do. Uh, Christ is elevated to be the, uh, the king and, and Christ. In Acts 2, verse 36, uh, notice, notice what they say here. <coughs> Excuse me. They said that this same uh, Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were preaching in their heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do for what? To be saved, to have our sins forgiven, to be forgiven for killing the Christ. Well, he's already told him in verse 21 that if they call the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Now, they understood that calling on the name of the Lord was not saying a prayer. They understood that calling on the name of the Lord was not asking Jesus to come into their heart. They had to understand that it was not simply believing on Jesus because obviously they already believed that he was the Lord in Christ. They said, what must we do? So they understood that there was something more to calling on the name of the Lord than simply saying a little prayer and asking Jesus to forgive our sins with his blood. If that were the case, Peter would have already told them that. But instead they said, what must we do? What shall we do? Uh, what shall we do to have our sins forgiven? And Peter tells them, Peter tells them in uh, Acts 2 and verse 38, notice what he says. He said, then Peter said uh, unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive and get the Holy Ghost. So here's what it is. What shall we do? Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, Marty's going to say, Oh, but it's in the name of Jesus. You've got to say the name of Jesus. Well, friends, if it's just saying the name of Jesus, if, that's, if saying the name of Jesus if being baptized in the name of Jesus means you pronounce the name because forgiveness of sins is in the name, then why would Peter tell them to repent and be baptized? Why don't you just say, say the name of Jesus. Just pronounce the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. You know why? Because being baptized in the name of Jesus does not have to do with what you say. It has to do with being baptized by his authority. He commanded you to be baptized and therefore if you're going to have forgiveness of sins that he is authorized to give, then it's going to have to be because you obeyed him. You got remission of sins. You had your sins forgiven because you obeyed his command. And that's what Peter tells them. They said, what shall we do? What shall we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now notice, Peter has told them to call on the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord? Calling on the name of the Lord? That's right. If you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So look at this. If we take Acts 2.21, where Peter says, <clears throat> whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And look at this verse. We know what saved is. Saved would be the equivalent of remission of sins. For salvation. To be saved. For the remission of sins. So what would the equivalent or the parallel of calling on the name of the Lord be? It would be repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's calling on the name of the Lord. It's, it is uh, synonymous with calling on the name of the Lord for the remission of sins is synonymous with to be saved. So calling on the name of the Lord is not saying a little prayer or asking Jesus to come into my heart and wash me of everything bad in my life. It's not confessing with my mouth that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That is not the sinner's prayer. That is not what we're talking about. Peter said, call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Then he tells him, repent and be baptized. 
That's calling on the name of the Lord. Now, how do I know that's the case? How do I know that's the case? Well, let's look at another verse here. Look at another parallel verse here in Acts 22 and verse 16. Acts 22 and verse 16, Saul of Tarsus has been told that he needs to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord has a connection with being baptized. See, if you're baptized, that's when you're calling on the name of the Lord. That's when you're washing away your sins. That's forgiveness of sin. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to wash away my sins? Be baptized. Calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord has to do with obeying what the Lord said, not saying a little prayer, not uttering his name. Whether you're standing in water or standing on dry ground, saying the name of Jesus is not going to save your sins, friends. It's not going to forgive, uh, uh, save your sins. Let's look at this. It's one, one, one more uh, illustration here. <coughs> one more illustration here. And I know we can't see this, so I need to. Uh, Romans 10, this is going to be kind of difficult to do. Romans 10 and uh, verse 13. Romans 10 and verse 13. This is, the, this is the verse that we've seen quoted quite a bit tonight by the people in the videos. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, now we have to know what that means. Now, in this particular passage, Paul actually writes it backwards. He's, he's going from being saved to what a person must do or what a person should have done. And he says, in other words, how can they, how shall they call on him who they've heard? See what he's talking about? They can't do this unless they've heard something. Well, friends, by the way, you never heard someone say, calling on the name of the Lord will say a sinner's prayer. In the New Testament, you never heard someone say, ask Jesus to come into your heart. You never heard someone say, and they never heard someone say, ask Jesus to wash away all the bad things in your life with his blood. You never heard anybody say that. So, how shall they call on him and whom they've not heard? And he says, how shall they, uh, on whom they not believed, I'm sorry, and whom they not believe, and how shall they believe in him who they're not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? I'm having trouble time reading that. And how shall they preach except someone be sent? Uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, friends, there's a parallel to these verses, Romans 10, 13 through 16, and Mark 16, 15 and 16. Notice this. You've got Jesus saying, go into all the world. Now Paul said, in order for someone to call them the Lord, first someone has to be sent. Well, Jesus said go. Well, that's the, that corresponds with being sent. And then Jesus said, and preach. Well, Paul said, if someone is sent, then they will preach. How are they going to call on the name of the Lord if they haven't preached? How are they going to preach if they're not sent? So you got someone sending because Jesus said go. Jesus said preach. Paul said someone's going to preach. Then <clears throat> Jesus said, he that believeth, that is, he that believes what he's heard, he that believes what is preached, well, Paul said a person is sent, they preach, and then what happens? They will believe. Why? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So you've got hearing, believing, someone being sent, hearing, believing. You've got Jesus saying, go, preach, 
and someone's going to believe. And then what's going to happen? Well, Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized. Well, the corresponding uh, a statement in Romans 10 is, how shall they call? They'll call in order to be saved. And then here it is. Jesus said, shall be saved. He that hear, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Go, preach. Someone believes. If they're baptized, they'll be saved. Paul said, someone needs to be sent. They need to preach so that someone can hear and believe. And then they will call on the name of the Lord. As that is, be baptized for the remission of sins. And then they'll be saved. The same statements that are made in Matthew, Mark 16, 15 and 16 are the same statements that Christ made or that Paul made in Romans 10. I'm sorry about that. Romans 10, Mark 16, parallel. Why? Because that's the plan of salvation. A person must hear the gospel, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Christ before man, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. No sinner's prayer. No sinner's prayer. No uh, bowing down on the, on the mourner's bench and and uh, trying to get right or someone shaking you and beating you and stomping on you or whatever. Friends, that's not in the Bible. But what is in the Bible is the plan of salvation, the gospel that we just heard. Now, let me quickly make this point. You see, friends, all of these denominations, they may sound different, but the, but the problem is always the same. They don't understand what the Bible is saying, and therefore, you will never get to heaven. You will never be saved listening to what they say. But studying the Bible with us, listening to what the Bible is saying, making sure that you're getting a word from the Lord will always ensure that you'll know what the will of God is. If we can help you in any way, friends, we're out of time. I'm going long. But if we can help you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for watching. Always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.